everyone. I'm Michael Bönig. I'm the Dean of the Business School at the University of Queensland. And like every person on business here today, we, have to, we had to face one of the most challenging and surprising years that we've probably ever seen. But we've had the immense pleasure to working with you all to adapt and as Lance said in the video, to co-create, to turn what felt like a nightmare into an opportunity to pivot together. And this word pivot might, might be one of the most used words recently. And uh, the smart people in the marketing team here came up with other options. They said, maybe we should instead aggressively swivel or strategically twirl or doing a tactical period. However you put it, it's a big change. So however you phrase it, organizations this year had to be agile, resilient, while also reaching to the heart of who they are. This afternoon, I will briefly be running you through some exciting developments at the University of Queensland's Business School uh, before handing over to an engaging panel of thought leaders to explore the topic of digital service transformation. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Turbo and Yagara people as traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of UQ, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It is a pleasure to be among such great company and on behalf of the Business School, we extend our deepest gratitude to each and every partner here today. And I have to say, uh, for those of you who had the chance to attend our industry lunch uh, last year, it, it does not feel exactly the same thing to doing this in, in a web format, but I hope we've got a good program for you that you find it exciting um, and, and interesting. And certainly uh, the panel is very exciting coming up. Industry connections and partnerships are the lifeblood of the business school. In a world led by disruption, it is more critical than ever before for industry, education and research to work together to co-create value for the community. As mentioned, this year demonstrates how an organization can plan everything out and then everything gets disrupted and turned upside down. On March 23rd, 2020, as COVID-19 made an entrance to, to Australia, we were tasked with transi uh, transitioning 215 business courses for more than 9,000 students from a face-to-face -face delivery into online teaching. A massive task. Staff worked tirelessly to support students and each other to achieve this unbelievable feat in only a few weeks. An achievement that, if we had planned for it, would have taken a lot longer. As a result, the impact to student enrollments has been much more positive than we could have ever expected. During the pandemic, there has also been a huge increase in those looking to study short courses. To quickly upskill as unemployment rose and businesses had to quickly adapt. So to help to support the business and tourism community devastated by the impacts of COVID-19, UQ Business School launched an initiative offering three of our most popular online courses to a thousand people for free. And we're still offering those courses, which are extremely popular at a price point of just $8 through our edX platform which is essentially just an administration fee. Normally these courses would be costing $540 each. To date, more than 50,000 people worldwide have uh, expressed their interest and, and, and registered their interest for these courses. We also supported an increased uptake for professionals looking to future-proof their careers, particularly in the MBA and in the postgraduate space. One main goal that has not changed this year for UQ Business School is our commitment to research and industry partnership that positively, positively impacts society and business. In fact, we increased our industry engagement by more than 28%. Our partnerships with you help solve problems affecting the community and businesses of all sizes. Whether that's helping companies to become more sustainable, transforming the future of healthcare, embedding ethics in areas such as artificial intelligence or innovating customer service. We are always looking for ways to shape our research to improve the lives of others. We don't limit ourselves to traditional business topics, 
but instead use our knowledge of business leadership and organizations to transform problems that need our expertise most in areas such as healthcare, aviation, remote communities, tourism, gender equality, and sustainability. It was this approach that gave birth to our research hubs, which we introduced to, uh, uh, to you last year, and who many of you are nowadays actually involved in actively. These hubs deliver bold ideas to help future-proof communities and businesses shape best practice and see change to think outside the box. The expertise of our researchers was leaned on heavily during the year as the effects of COVID-19 continue to unfold. For example, Associate Professor Gabby Walters helped tourism businesses shape their recovery strategy after the summer bushfires and ongoing industry disruption. And Professor Sean Bond helped Australians navigate their investments through the pandemic. 2020 also brought exciting new collaboration opportunities. As an example, Professor Andrew Burton Jones, who is one of the leaders of the Future of Health um, uh, Business Hub, partnered with Queensland Health and the Digital CRC to research how to improve healthcare services through digital innovation. UQ Business School is also partnering with the Australian Defence Force to support national security efforts through AI with a digital innovation bridge, a project led by our entrepreneur in residence, Cameron Turner. After hearing some of the updates and developments within the business school, you might be wondering how can you be involved or what other opportunity, opportunities there are for you to engage with our community and students. First of all, we appreciate that and you're welcome to engage with us. From research partnerships to mentoring, presenting or attending one of our industry events, sharing your story or tapping into our world-class students for your recruitment, there are so many ways we invite you to connect with the business school. If you want to know more, email us or ask the person that invited you today to join you with new possibilities. Now over to the panel discussion for today, we're going to discuss how to thrive, not just survive, digital transformation in a global pandemic. I would like to welcome Dr. Christoph Breitbach, the co-lead of our Service Innovation Alliance Research Hub to introduce the panelists. Thanks, Christoph. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction and good afternoon. 2020 has been a challenging and yet transformative year. The global COVID-19 pandemic has been a catalyst for many societal changes and experiments. Free childcare ventures like JobKeeper that some have considered the first step into a universal basic income in Australia, new ways of working with Zoom now dominating the working life of many of us to transformations of entire sectors with, like Michael mentioned, higher education being but one of many that fundamentally changed its modus operandi. And for us, that was on-campus lectures into virtual ones within a matter of weeks. The dominating theme, however, that we've seen in 2020 is the increased use of and reliance on digital technologies. And in fact, COVID-19 has likely increased the pace of digital transformation in society more broadly. Now, when we talk about digital transformation, we really mean digital service transformation. So today we are talking about the digital transformation of service businesses in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our panel today is linked to the UQ Service Innovation Alliance, an interdisciplinary research hub here at the Business School that aims to foster close interactions between industry, society, and academia through what we call use-inspired research. Now, use-inspired research means that we address real-world phenomena like the digital transformation of service more broadly by initially identifying managerial challenges or problems associated with the phenomenon in order to conduct research that is then aligned with specific socioeconomic needs and thereby has an impact on society. So with that said, please do join me in welcoming our three panelists today all of whom are representing organizations that are directly involved with the activities of the UQ Service Innovation Alliance. And first, we have Dr. Janine Bankhuisen, who is the founder and CEO of the Tech Girls Movement Foundation and the CEO of Android Research. As a futurist, 
Janine believes that existing structures in the technology industry must change in order to serve, serve tomorrow's digital landscape and that our children's future job prospects depend on it. Her focus is on leadership, innovation and education to champion Australian tech entrepreneurship and address the necessary rebalancing of gender roles within the traditionally male dominated STEM space. Testament to her achievements in the past six years, she has engaged over 8,000 schoolgirls in STEM entrepreneurship across more than 1,000 schools, matched with over 1,000 mentors who volunteered over 7,500 hours of their time. Janine also distributed over 80,000 free Tech Girls Are Superhero books to Australian schools. Welcome, Janine. Thank you, Christoph, and thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, second up is Kelsey Seeger, who is an innovation analyst at Credit Union Australia, and as such, is in the thick of it when it comes to implementing innovations. Kelsey's career began in advertising, where she learned the importance of simplicity and narrative before it evolved into the innovation space. Kelsey's life is all about finding ways to actualize innovation strategies and partnerships in the financial services space using her self-proclaimed incessant curiosity, charming change management, and scrappy project management. Welcome, Kelsey. Hi. Looking forward to talking with all of you. Um, and last but not least, we have with us today Joseph Healy, a career international banker who has held executive positions at NAP, ANZ, CIBC World Markets, Citibank, and Lloyd Bank. He's joining us today as the co-founder and co-CEO of Judo Bank, Australia's first new bank that, according to the AFR, as of May 2020, achieved unicorn status with a valuation in excess of $1 billion. Uh, Joseph is also a fellow of FINCA, fellow of the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland, and he has authored three books, including his last latest piece, Breaking the Banks, What Went Wrong with Australia's Banking, that appeared in 2019. Uh, outside of the financial services industry, Joseph was also a director of the Football Federation Australia from 2010 through to 2018, and he has five international football caps for Scotland at youth level. Welcome, Joseph. Now, um, thank you all for, for joining us today, um, and I'd like to uh, start by really exploring your experience in the COVID scenario in 2020. So um, Kelsey, as a well-established service business with over seven years history, um, what were some of the challenges that you experienced when having to transform CUA services in response to COVID-19? Yeah, so CUA being over 70 years old means we have a lot of legacy systems. So I don't know how many of you guys have actually gone through legacy tech. You know, when you look at those old school, you know, phones and you're like, oh my gosh, how do they make that work? That's us, but think about it in banking terms. So for us, COVID was a wonderful catalyst to help us prioritize what incremental changes we could do to make stuff work because we obviously have a big mass of transformation agenda and projects that we're currently going through. But once COVID hit, we kind of can't keep saying we're gonna come back to you in six months with a streamlined process. So for us, it was incremental innovations came in. So some of it for us was tiny things like for financial assistance applications, we got in around 4,000 of them. If we followed our old process, pre-COVID, it was very time heavy. It would be a horrible experience for everyone and wouldn't fit the timeline. So our robotics team actually set up this uh, process automation and made it so 1,750 applications were just straightforward processed and put through there. So I kind of, in a weird way, enjoyed COVID because it's that really great way when you know you have a cluttered list of projects you need to do. It helped us prioritize. And also for us as well, it unlocked a lot of our collaboration screens and technology features. So I enjoy being a young in a very old organization because when I ask if I can use Zoom and all of them are like, no, you can't share screens inside my head. I'm like, we have phones, we can easily do this. So the organization got on tracks, we opened collaborative technology. So it was actually a wonderful experience for us to get our digital proficiency up. So I really enjoyed it. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you, Kelsey. I guess there's a silver lining to um, to everything. Um, Joseph, uh, unlike uh, CUA, Judo Bank is still very much a new market entrant in the financial services space. Um, can you maybe reflect on your experience and potential challenges of running a service business in 2020? Sure. I mean, the first big challenge that we had is that we've gone from being a, a PowerPoint to a fully licensed and fully fledged bank within three years. And as a young company um, in a highly regulated industry, uh, we wanted to continue our growth. And so when COVID emerged in, in late March 2000, early this year, uh, we were faced with a number of challenges. Uh, one was that we'd, we'd gone from 100 staff to 170 staff inside nine months when we in the, on the onset of COVID. So we were still knitting together the social fabric of the organization. And at the same time, we had actually had 52 job offers in, in the market. So we, we, had a, we, we had, we're on a significant growth curve uh, and an organization that was moving fast. Uh, and suddenly this huge dislocation occurred. Uh, and, and at the same time, not only did we have the challenge of, of trying to hold the organization together, and I say strengthen the social fabric, uh, we had a whole series of projects that were live and were critical to the, the, the success of the company that we had to continue to progress. And at the same time, we had lent a lot of money. We, at the onset of COVID, we had a billion, 1.7 billion of loans outstanding to small to mid-sized businesses right across the country. And of course, small to mid-sized businesses in particular, and, and particularly in Victoria, had been significantly impacted by COVID. So the, the challenges were not just the internal challenges of maintaining momentum in a fast growing, but still a young organization, uh, but also in helping support the many, many businesses that we've lent money to, who were, you know, many of them were quite um, in a state of shock as to, given the uncertainty in the environment, uh, as to what the implications might be uh, should the, the COVID conditions um, stay with us for a long time. So there's a multitude of challenges and I, I, it does, to my mind, it brought home the importance of agility, not just organizational agility, but strategic agility, um, maintaining momentum, but dealing at the same time with all of the uncertainty and you have regulators and you have investors and you have other people asking how is the bank going and will the bank survive you have staff who are all new relatively speaking to the organization having left the, the more traditional mainly more traditional banks asking how is uh, how uh, viable is the bank will it survive the the storm so there was it was a huge management challenge a leadership challenge i should say as well as a management challenge um, and I think a lot of us learned and grew, uh, grew in maturity in terms of running the business uh, or during this period. It was, in many cases, a real life stress test in more ways than one. And I think it, it demonstrated just, you know, we set up the stall of building an agile bank. Um, and this was a real test of our agility and resilience. And uh, hopefully you can see from the smile on my face, I feel as if we've navigated the stormy and choppy waters that uh, that COVID represented, um, and learned a lot as a result, and particularly our willingness to support small to mid-sized businesses and to be true to our purpose of being a, a business bank that businesses can trust. I feel that we've passed all of those tests and learned a lot about ourselves. That the the the, the rhetoric, if you will, and the strategy that we had outlined, we've lived that in practice, and so it's been a. It's been, I, don't want to, I don't want to sound um, uh, that been a success, it has been successful from a business point of view, but clearly it involved, it's been quite a tragic time for so many people. And so I don't want to overplay the, the, the success, if you will, because of the seriousness of the, the environment that we all had to uh, operate in. Mm, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, uh, the COVID situation has indeed had an impact on so many businesses, um, many of, and individuals who are. Uh, very unfortunately heavily impacted, um, which I think brings us to Janine. Um, Janine, you do work with many community groups. Um, so shifting from an individual organizational perspective to the wider Australian society, 
um, in, in your work, what are some of your experiences in how COVID-19 affected communities and organizations that you're working with? Uh, thanks, Christoph. I can't agree enough with Joseph in terms of um, about agility and momentum. They are two really important um, takeaways from this year or things that I guess we were able to do that were essential. And uh, I heard a quote, which was um, what, what you did in 2020 to get through and to survive um, is your currency for 2021. And I really like that. I think that's really helpful to think of, um, you know, it wasn't a time to have a holiday and take time off. It was a time to, yeah, to be agile, to pivot, um, to readjust, to do all of those things and think about what really matters. And I think there's no better way to think about that than if we look at our young people um, across Australia. So I work a lot with schools and schools really are a pulse of the country in a lot of ways, I think. And working with schools, so most do have access uh, to digital learning or the ability for digital learning, but some have literally no possibility at all. So we have, uh, for instance, schools have, the hubs have the, the ability, but some schools in regional places literally don't have internet access or enough regular access to actually support digital learning. So some places it wasn't even possible to do that regardless of what was going on around them. And, but in saying that, we have managed to reach more than a thousand girls in our virtual workshops this year in design thinking. And for us, that's been a big change to move everything online because normally I'd be traveling the country, visiting schools and, and seeing uh, young people face to face. Uh, but young people, it, it is their space. They do like to be online. They, in many uh, circumstances, they do thrive. Uh, however, we have very inclusive environments, but the marginalized people are more further marginalized. So for instance, if you have a young person in the face-to-face -face classroom and they don't have a voice or a presence in that classroom, that does tend to get marginalized online. So there's some of the things we need to be actively thinking about. And it's not just taking offline online and expecting to use the same teaching strategies and so on. It's really important to, uh, to understand the nuances of, of um, being engaging as a presenter online, uh, particularly for long periods of time. Uh, and for many sessions a day, it, it's definitely not an easy thing to do. So there's a lot of assumptions around digital literacy, around access to technology for homes and particularly for young people, which have fallen through in, in our examples, even though we have some positive ones. Um, and there have been some good things that come out of this because we were prepared to go online, I guess, because we've always been an online um, organization. My team is virtual. My, my business manager's in Canberra, I'm in Brisbane. Um, but in saying that, I think we had to get creative locally with our young people and get them to tap into what's important to them. So a really great example is, do you know what a nurdle is? I don't know if anyone knows what a nurdle is. So a nurdle is actually a piece of microplastic and they wash up on the beach in quite significant amounts down in um, Warrnambool and the south coast of Victoria. And so some of our young girls in our um, program got together and created a group called Nurdlers and they went out and they were actually collecting um, the nurdles with some innovative technique they created through our workshops. So it has brought home for them to focus on what's important to them locally and, and work together as a community, because that's really where our strengths are. Um, thank you, Janine. And, and again, maybe this is a good opportunity to um, advance the discussion a little bit and uh, to now talk about some of the opportunities uh, that the COVID-19 situation has brought, uh, for example, in the space of innovation or service innovation more generally. So um, could actually COVID-19 be a catalyst that is fundamentally changing that we think about innovation and uh, now uh, engage in, in more innovation opportunities? Um, Kelsey, you've, um, you've touched a little bit on, on the notion of having to act very fast. Um, could you maybe share with us your experience in what it was like to pivot from long-term to short-term business goals as part of these innovation processes? Absolutely. So with um, our organization, our goals are decided basically a full year prior. You know, you have it lined up. It's very systematic. And then come March, all of this got um, paused. And when we had our priorities. So my team, for example, we're Horizon 3. So we're supposed to look five years ahead, start leading up to times because it takes a while to implement, you know, see what we want to do and go through. But once all of this hit, we went, stopped looking five years ahead and started looking at the tiny things we could do internally. So some of this stuff, because also COVID, you know, in the banking you know, sector did affect a lot of profitability margins, sustainability margins. What can we do for our loan books? How are we going to balance all this out? So for a lot of our stuff, it was how can you innovate in, you know, for stuff that needs to be fixed this year with limited to no budget? 
because a lot of this stuff too is you can't rely on the fact that you can throw money at it to kind of fix it. So it's, you know, what with our process, what with our teams, what with our subject matter experts can we do to fix things? And we acknowledge even on this for expectations that we're not gonna fix everything, but if you can fix, you know, one or two steps in an entire process that does have incremental innovation coming through. Okay. So w would you say that the ways of working have fundamentally changed for you yeah. in the innovation space? Yes. Yeah. So our team was, we're a traditional bank, which is why I'm secretly so excited about Joseph being here. Um, <laughs> so our teams were 100% based in office, face-to-face -face meetings and all of that stuff. COVID um, made it so we had planned on going to a hybrid work model. But COVID literally made what was a nine month transformation plan happen within three weeks. So all of this was a big massive shift for everyone in the organization for setting up VPNs, making so we could log in, access to collaborative technology, upping the literacy too. Because the other part of any program is the digital literacy of the staff and digital proficiency of the staff. Because the hard part is if you're working from home, it's very difficult, how shall I say, to have someone on IT talk you through on the phone about the steps you need to take on the screen that you need to do to get to the document. You know, you just spend 45 minutes, what took you one minute in the office to kind of go through and managing the frustration. So for us, it was just time boxing everything so we got to the best of. And as horrible as this was for everyone, the other part is we were all in this change together, which made change easier because if we're all equally struggling to understand how to use, for example, WebEx, it bonds you. So you up your digital proficiency, you up your empathy with each other, and you kind of get to have some momentum going forward. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with this. And, you know, we've experienced the same thing. Um, on, on the flip side, I know all the kids and the dogs of my coworkers now, which is, of course, also fantastic. <laughs> Um, but uh, Joseph, um, how, how is it for you? Would you like to respond to Kelsey's uh, comments? Did COVID maybe present opportunities for service innovation at Judo Bank that otherwise wouldn't have presented themselves? Yeah, well, I think one of the things about COVID that um, we were you know, both talking to our staff about, but also talking to our customers about, is that whilst it's a, it's, it's a a crisis situation, it's also an opportunity to reflect on the, the major projects, the major initiatives, the, the one, two, three year horizons. Because so many people on the day-to-day the -day hustle and bustle of the dance floor rarely get the time to go onto the balcony and look across the horizon and see what opportunities that might be there. Um, so from a Juno perspective, we, we had always had on our agenda the, the role of artificial intelligence or machine learning in the way that we provide service to our customers. We, we very much saw it as a 2021, 22 um, initiative, but the, the, the changes that we saw with COVID and the time to reflect and the time to plan, the luxury of having the time to do that, uh, and, and then invest heavily in our thinking around well, what does machine or AI really mean in a judo context? And do we have, in a cultural sense, an organization that can embrace uh, AI, given you know, the, the kind of myth, myths, the many myths that people have on what artificial intelligence means? So we, we spent, um, and I personally took a leadership role in this, we spent uh, most of May and June, and the best part of July, actually, doing a deep dive in, in, in understanding how we would apply artificial intelligence to our whole business model from our decisioning, uh, customer decisioning, and then to our customer service. And as a result of that, we decided to fast track our investment. And so now we've assembled a team and working with an external subject matter experts uh, on building AI capability with the intention, not only to have it um, in, implemented within Juro by mid 2021, but also to build it as a banking platform that is capable then of being sold or licensed to other uh, institutions, both domestically and internationally. So I think the, the big, one of the big uh, achievements, if you will, or one of the big successes of COVID has been the ability to get off the hustle and bustle of the daily dance floor of life onto the balcony and to reassess priorities, to bring forward things that 
may have been uh, two or three years out. And also to assess, you know, take stock of some of the core assumptions that you had made about the business and the, and the environment that the business is operating in. I um, mean, the one big thing for me, uh, which I felt back in, in April and I still feel very strongly today, is that the external environment that we hopefully will, will return to some degree of normality, but the normality will be a new normality. It won't be a pre-COVID normality. And therefore, the big question that you have to ask is given what that new normality might look like, are the core assumptions of un that underpin your business still the right core assumptions? Uh, and again, COVID has given us the luxury of time to reflect on some of those big questions and, uh, and not waste the hopefully once in a lifetime situation that COVID has created. So it, it has been very productive. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I, we've, we've touched on many very interesting aspects um, and uh, maybe I'll try to just dissect uh, some of them right now. Um, both Kelsey and, uh, and Joseph, you've spoken about customers and your customers. So maybe we use this as an opportunity to, to shift the conversation a little bit um, into, into the deeper role and impact of COVID-19 on, on your customers and ways that you were able to potentially either help them create new customer experiences in this digital space. Um, so Kelsey, I'm wondering, could you maybe share with us some observations of how your customers experienced 2020 and what some of their challenges were? Yeah, um, so being a organization with over 74 years of history and stuff, our customers are actually of an older demographic. So the average customer age for us is around 51. So for us, COVID was one of those where we kind of saw that we need to provide greater level of comfort as we are helping people get onto online banking and the like. So digital literacy and proficiency is kind of a big thing for us. So we probably don't have digital natives who completely understand, can do online banking. They don't understand what the confusion is about logging in. You know, we're having to go to members who don't really want a computer, don't really like online banking, did enjoy the branch experience, did prefer to call, talk up and, you know, speak to people about this. So for us during COVID, it was a lot of our customer experience was making sure we respected how the customer wanted to use the channel rather than dictating how we want the channel to be used. Because that was a big shift for us kind of going there. So younger ones, we found like we've upped our mobile apps, our online experience and onboarding. But for our call center was explaining and giving them talking sheets to actually explain to a member who was say, used to going into branch that, you know, this is how you get onto your computer. Here, I'll show you the steps on this. Do you have these lockers accidentally set up in your settings? But giving our call center staff, you know, a proper way to talk and explain that experience through. Because for a lot of our members, they're calling because they're in crises. So, you know, they're stressed about their home loan repayments. They're stressed about, you know, access to, or even some of them really liked cash. We had one member who took out all of their cash savings, which was interesting. And then a week later brought it all back to put it back into the bank. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of just making sure we didn't make it a worse experience for them when they're already stressed. So our big thing was a yes and how can we help instead of a no, not our channel. You need to go follow this email. You need to go do this. Okay. Um, thank you, Kelsey. Now, um, Janine, we've, I know that you are very passionate about um, bridging the digital divide in, in society. Um, and you touched earlier in one of your comments on the fact that uh, different socioeconomic groups have often limited access to digital technologies. Um, can you maybe share with us some of your experiences um, on, on how these individuals have experienced the COVID-19 situation and what can be done to help these community groups? Fabulous, thanks, Christoph. Uh, I think the future is definitely hybrid. Uh, there, there's no question that online is here to stay in some capacity for almost everything that we do now. But what that does mean is the, the accelerated need for digital literacy. Uh, reports uh, very clearly state that many of our young people are barely digitally literate. Yes, they're able to use a device in terms of a phone and apps and things like that, but to move beyond the basic use of technology is actually quite challenging for many young people, which is actually quite surprising. And some of the research that I'm doing with DQ at the moment, that's coming out 
not only for seniors, but also for young people as well. And often the flashier the device, the less skills they actually have in using it. Um, and particularly for people, uh, for seniors, they don't know things like um, you can make your font bigger and those kinds of accessibility options on your devices. So they're starting at the very basics. And for young people, education and schools are the source of information for them. But for older people and everyone else, I guess, in society outside of school, it's, it's local libraries. Libraries are becoming really essential to, uh, um, to everybody. And um, yeah, particularly seniors, they'll buy a device, they'll go to the library, the library has to teach them how to use it. And so it's actually changing the skill set that we need in society that was traditionally there. Librarians didn't used to teach uh, people how to log into the internet banking um, and how to be, keep their information secure. And I mean, what's happening in this process is that the people working in the libraries are actually seeing personal information of vulnerable people in, in the community, which is a serious, serious challenge. So I think the digital literacy is really important, but it's about upskilling people and giving them the tools they need, but not just the tools, the education around why they're doing what they're doing and the consequences of their actions. And so I know in our project that we're working on is we're looking at literacy, digital literacy, digital competence and digital expertise and the differences between them. And the way I see it, it, it starts with the, the what, the how and the why. So you, the what you do, then how do you do it, then why are you doing it? And that's the progression um, through digital literacy, I think, and to those skills beyond that. Uh, certainly uh, what we find in our young people, there's, there's two things that actually bridges the digital divide we're finding across actually age groups. It's practical skills in terms of being able to find authority sources online or being able to distinguish between authority sources online of information and also being able to troubleshoot. It's, it's really surprising how many people don't have the motivation, inclination, whatever it may be, to troubleshoot when they come across a problem, younger people and older people and everyone in between. And so their basic skills, I think, if you ask for a call to action, what can we do? They are things that we can absolutely be doing in the community, um, in, in our families, uh, to help people get the basic skills they need and not assume they know how to log into their internet banking. Um, they absolutely don't. Okay, thank you, Janine. Um, now, I do want to make sure that we have sufficient time for Q&A um, for the remainder of today's seminar. So maybe what we could do now is just uh, do a quick reflection from, from all of you before we go into the Q&A session. Um, I wonder what are some of the lessons learned or key takeaway messages that you would like to share with the audience today? And maybe we'll start with Kelsey. Um, so for us, our big takeaway from this big massive thrive to survive with the digital transformation is actually self-kindness. So the hard part is when COVID hit and all of this with everything going pause, we found culturally, you know, we got very frustrated with ourselves that we weren't here, we hadn't done, we needed to kind of thing. And taking that stock in our heads of, you know, we don't need to be perfect to be better. And that was a key thing like this did for us. And even as we approach projects is we took away that perfectionist mindset instead just focused on what can we do better, which actually really helps you because it gives you space to breathe rather than feeling a little bit trapped because yeah, COVID is a crisis. So it is affecting you in your personal life, professional life and in an organization as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Joseph, your key takeaway messages. Uh, I, I think that if we're looking for a positive in what has been a very challenging year, is that it's created a catalyst for change. And so both at a personal level and at a business level, if, if businesses don't feel that the world has changed or, 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 or that is likely to change, then they arguably have wasted um, a crisis in the sense that there should have been a chance, an opportunity to make the big, ask the big questions, think about the big issues and think about how your business and you as, you as an individual uh, are going to operate in a post-COVID world. And that's very much the strong message that we have given to our, our staff and, and to our customers that don't waste the crisis that COVID-19 represented. And Janine. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. So this year we had 47 teams of girls who spent 16 weeks in a STEM entrepreneurship program building an app and a business plan to solve problems in their local community. So 47 teams of girls, 59 entered, 47 finished. And they were grateful we provided something consistent during a, a very uncertain time. So 
I think there's a really good lesson in that. So rather than dropping everything, just being consistent, being there and supporting. Uh, one of the libraries in Brisbane, they actually, they were closed for seven weeks. They phoned their clients. They made 6,000 phone calls in seven weeks and their clients were saying it felt like Christmas. No one had called them. So sometimes going back to basics and being kind, I think that's such a good lesson out of all of this. We so need to be kind. And I, uh, I just want to uh, finish with, uh, my, with a quote, actually, because we match our teams of school girls with industry mentors. And that obviously posed a lot of challenges this year, working in a virtual environment. Um, but it opened up some opportunities. And I think this, this feedback from one of the mentors catches a lot of really good messages in it. So she, the mentor says, when I heard that I would be mentoring through virtual means only, I was a bit apprehensive at how I'd be able to be an effective mentor and keep my team engaged when I couldn't see them in person. Lo and behold, it was just my luck that I was grouped with a team of highly energetic uh, and brought lots of ideas to the table each week and provided a much needed break from the daily grind at work. Though we could only see each other through a camera, I still felt a connection to everyone else in the, on the other side. The camera also provided a bit of humour as I found myself wearing makeup made entirely of whiteboard markers and looking far better than uh, I had in the months working from home. <laughs> so though I was initially nervous, uh, it was an incredible opportunity with an incredible group of people. I think that says a lot about what we can take away from this year and resilience um, in our young people is, is absolutely uh, there and I think we can all learn from them. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Now I'd like to open a uh, question and answer. So um, to our uh, attendees, if you do have a question, please do post it in the Q&A section here. And we've already had a few questions uh, that have popped up throughout the uh, panel discussion. So I'll just go uh, through them in the order that they came through. Um, the first question came from uh, Genevieve Gregor to Joseph and Kelsey. Uh, what is the biggest challenge your organization is facing digitally at the moment? And how are you looking to solve it? Um, so again, maybe Kelsey, we'll, we'll start with you. What is the biggest challenge your organization is facing digitally at the moment? How are you looking to solve it? Um, so our biggest challenge we're trying, uh, looking for is that we are currently in the middle of a transformation. So we have some legacy systems, um, which we're trying to work to kind of match the speed and cadence that we need to do. So a little bit cloud migrations, a little bit, you know, data processing and all of that. So our big focus is we've kind of focused it in on our key area. We want to streamline smoothly. So COVID deep priorities. So that's our home lending transformation. So everything we're doing this year is about our home lending transformation program and just making sure that one is in its best state, you know, from beginning, middle and end. And then we can go on and reprioritize and look at what else we do because we do do insurance and health insurance as well. But yeah, that's our focus. Thank you, Kelsey. And um, Joseph, the same question for you. What is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is to get everybody inside the organization to view data as a strategic asset. Mm. In an industry that has been very poorly disciplined in its use of data. I'm talking about the banking industry generally. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to build up, as I mentioned earlier, an AI-enabled bank into the future. Therefore, to do that, data has got to be seen as sacred and important strategic asset. The challenge is not so much technology or the implementation of technology, it's the culture inside the organization because the culture is steeped in, in an industry that has traditions um, that, uh, that does not, as I mentioned earlier, generally speaking, does not respect data um, and it's the cultural challenge of making sure that as we are building our, our AI capabilities, that people are seeing data that we use and, and all sorts of data as being an important to the future of the company rather than a chore or something that is uh, unnecessary. Very good, very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, Genevieve, for, for your question. Uh, the next question is from Anissa Hansen and uh, Janine that uh, go out, goes out to you. Uh, Janine, can you please tell us more about the attitudes held by our younger people about COVID-19? As the leaders of the future, how did they adapt to the change and have they embraced the shift to digital learning? Great question, Anissa, and I'll answer the latter part first, if that's okay. Uh, certainly, they have embraced uh, the move to digital learning, and, but some have really thrived in the online environment, particularly those who have been experiencing bullying at school having the home environment to get away from that constant daily face-to-face -face, um, experience has been a welcome um, shift. So there have been some absolute um, benefits. I think 
what we're facing though is um, online fatigue, um, particularly the young people, our educators, this expectation we're always online. So our, one of our challenges, I think, just to the first question as well, is how do we teach technology without technology? Um, and, you know, it's been done before, it's not a new thing, but certainly going back to basics again. And so young people, I think, have, have just accepted it, just said, you know, it's here, let's just get on with it and let's care about people, let's be kinder, let's find meaningful things that we can do in the community to help people. Uh, and to be honest, the, the topics that the girls came up with this year were quite different to previous years, but it was more thoughtful, it was a lot more thoughtful. Uh, I don't know how to measure that, but you could, you could see that there was thoughtfulness in uh, their way of approaching problems and, and bringing other people with them along on the, on the journey with them. Thank you, um, thank you, Janine. Uh, Ian Dover is asking a question um, to all of you. There's been a digital divide between the urban and the regional communities in Australia, not just the, the comes technology, but in the application of digital capabilities to all aspects of life and work. While COVID has dramatically accelerated the uptake of some digital capabilities, do you think it has narrowed or widened the digital divide between urban and regional Australia. Um, now, Joseph, I, I understand uh, judo is active in, in all areas in Australia. Um, maybe you can respond to that. Well, my sense, and I, I don't have data to, to support this, but my sense is that it, it, it potentially has widened that gap rather than closed that gap. I, I think that, that Someone mentioned earlier about, about momentum or, or accelerating um, progress. I think you know, rural or certainly to urban areas or where technology and access to technology is much more deeply entrenched, they, the use of it has been accelerated from, from what I can see. I don't have any evidence or sense whether that has been the same case in rural areas and therefore my, my sense, but again, it's, it's more a, a gut instinct rather than a knowledge fact-based view is that it's widened the gap. Okay. Um, Janine, do you agree with that or disagree? Not necessarily. In the research that I'm doing with the University of Queensland, we literally had a meeting about this exact question this morning, which is a core part of our, our work. And in, because if you take government services, for instance, the expectation is you fill out every single one of them online. Okay. So you have to find the skills somehow or get some help to do it. So I think in that way, absolutely, the use has happened more. But there's people are getting support because they're reaching out because they literally have no choice. It's a necessity. So I think in that way, it is certainly moving the digital divide, um, I think, narrowing it uh, because it's just become that necessity. And it's just that the daily occurrence that we're expecting, regardless of our age or where we live. Um, but certainly in regional areas, it, it is more challenging. And that's why we need to lean on resources like our local libraries um, to help us to um, lessen that divide, narrow that divide. So, yeah. Good point, thank you. Kelsey, um, what, is, what is your experience? So I'm gonna be the one that rides the middle on this. So we find that we don't know if it's narrowing or widening because we don't have the data for it, but we're finding it's drawing awareness to the divide where previously it was maybe unspoken un, un, you know, unaware. Like CUA, for example, because we do have an older member base, we have this partnership called Connect Your, Connect to Future Partnerships. It's between us, the Red Cross and Info Exchange, but all of this was, you know, we, our community division have been hawking off that, you know, you have vulnerable members in rural areas who don't know how to use a computer, who don't know how to get, you know, online. And you keep expecting them to somehow have the initiative to know to have the right question when they don't even know where to start. And considering most of us jump online and use Google, you know, if you're not digitally literate, that big step is a massive step. So for us, like this partnership, it's been, over a year old, but we found like a strong awareness to culturally for the organization. And I will say this, our innovation department, I never really thought about digital literacy very much for what it meant for someone who didn't really understand some of those steps. So COVID at least has made me realize that I was being a bit insensitive and not noticing. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And that last question is from uh, Diane Harner, who's asking, what are your insights about how to optimize collaboration in an online environment? Um, 
Joseph, you spoken earlier about uh, bringing everyone together, especially many new employees. Uh, well, you- I think yeah. I mean, I think one of the one of the changes and one of the positives out of COVID has been the extent to which people have been communicating and connecting with each other um, through online channels. Um, you know, people ad- adjusted to the fact that face to face was not was not in many parts of the country. Um, was not possible. And I think there's been a proliferation of, of uh, networking uh, using various digital means, which, is be, which I think has been a positive. I mean, most of us who say, spend all day looking at, on Zoom meetings can kind of, I think there's been a big fade factor in terms of our enthusiasm, but there's no question about the productivity of communication, if I can use that phrase. It has significantly uh, uh, step changed and for the positive. So I think I think that's been one of the one of the factors that, as I mentioned earlier, that COVID has actually changed so many things in in, in business and in society generally. Uh, and and you know I I spend once once a week I would be in forums, international forums, um, that previously I would have had to jump on a plane and go to, but now I question the need to fly to London for a two day for conference. When I, I can get this, I can get a higher level of satisfaction and productivity doing it through, you know, Zoom or other 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 means. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, now, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our allocated time. Uh, but Kelsey, Joseph, and Janine, thank you very much for your time today, and thank you very much for sharing your important and uh, fascinating insights with us here in this panel. So, um, everyone, please do join me in um, thanking our panelists uh, in the the chat through a virtual round of applause. Um, So once again, Kelsey, Joseph, and Janine, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for your support of the UQ Innovation, Service Innovation Alliance. Um, To our attendees, if you do have any other questions or comments, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to uh, set up a contact. Now I'm handing things over to uh, our head of school, Professor Michael Bruning, um, and once again, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, and and the amazing panel for this really interesting discussion. I would like to take the opportunity to formally say a big thank you to everybody who is here today. This event is all about appreciation of your support for us and the significant value that you bring to the UQ Business School. We aim to foster a collaborative and shared partnership, allowing UQ Business School to also provide value to your company and aligned goals. Together, we can create change. Thank you for taking the time out, out of your day today, this afternoon. And I'm glad to say we're staying within the hour. So I, we didn't take too much of that time. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>